Ron crossed over and became an FBI agent. A few years later, when interviewing world.renowned detective Ron Greenwood, reporters asked. May I ask, what made you persevere on the path of solving a case? Luan tilted his head and glanced at the sports car beside him, the villa behind him, and the beautiful woman in the villa, then smiled slightly. Of course, it's the bonus after solving the case. What? Keywords of the novel FBI Detective No Pop-Ups, FBI Detective TXT Complete Collection Download, FBI Detective Latest Chapter Reading Chapter 1 Newly Interned FBI Agents You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 1 Newly Interned FBI Agents New York, 26, Federal Square, Manhattan, Jacob Federal Office Building, 9 a.m. The 23rd to 26th floors are the exclusive headquarters of the New York branch of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A small conference room. I didn't expect to become the legendary FBI. In the back corner of the conference table, Ron sat on a chair, raised his hand to see his formal suit, and then looked at the golden badge hanging on his chest, his face expressionless. He remembers that he only went to the island country to explore the local customs and characteristics, how could he come here with his eyes closed on the plane? Pa Pa, the door to the conference room was pushed open, and a middle-aged white man with a Mediterranean hairstyle and a suit walked in with a folder in his hand. He scanned around and saw no one missing, and without hesitation, went straight to the main topic. Attention, this is a shooting and murder case in the park. Mediterranean opened the folder and threw a pile of photos onto the conference table, introducing. The victim's name is Mike Robert, 43 years old. At 11.34 p.m. on April 11, 2005, he was shot and killed on a small path in Central Park. Upon hearing the overview of the case, the intern detectives on both sides of the conference table went to retrieve the photos from the table. Ron remained motionless as he was sorting through the sticky memories in his mind. In his past life, he was raised by an old assassin who was struggling to survive. As he grew up, he naturally learned a whole set of skills, with excellent professional skills and high technical level. Since entering the industry, he has never missed a chance and has never received any orders from others. The purpose of the old assassin raising Luan is to make him avenge his own blood. When the old assassin died and Luan successfully set out to search for his enemy, he learned that the enemy had been arrested by the local law enforcement department and sentenced to death by the court. The enemy was alone without any relatives, and Luan dared not confront the prison. After thinking for a few seconds, he turned his head and boarded the plane to the island country, preparing to experience the local customs and then open a milk tea shop to spend the rest of his life. Killers are impossible to do, they are impossible to do in this lifetime. The risk is high, and money comes slowly. How can one make money by opening a milk tea shop in an island country? Sir, I have one thing that I don't understand. When the Mediterranean briefly introduced the case, a white young man named Fisher with short brown hair and thin lips tilted his head and asked. Why was this case handed over to us? There is no need to mobilize the FBI for an ordinary murder case, the New York Police Department can handle it on its own. Without waiting for the Mediterranean to answer, Mona, a red short-haired white beauty wearing a standard suit with exceptionally smooth curves and an extremely aerodynamic figure, looked disdainfully at Fisher and said. The victim was a black special correspondent who had returned from the war zone, and the words pest were written in blood next to the body, making it clear that this was a special hate crime aimed at the victim's identity. Special hate crimes are under the jurisdiction of the FBI. After listening to Mona's words, Mediterranean nodded calmly and scanned the motionless Luan at the end of the conference table. His eyebrows furrowed slightly but he didn't pay attention, clapping his hands to attract everyone's attention and saying. This special hate crime case is the next stage of the test. You twenty new intern detectives need to solve the case and catch the murderer on your own within three days. Senior detectives will give corresponding points based on your performance. Those with high points can first become regular detectives, 
while those with low points will continue to work hard. After speaking, Mediterranean didn't organize the folder and turned around before leaving the conference room. At the moment the door of the conference room closed, there was a loud bang, and many new intern detectives leaned forward to check the photos and clues. What aspect is the pest on the ground next to the victim's body targeted at? Black identity or journalist identity? It's also possible that both are present. Perhaps there are more journalists' identities, as the victims have returned from the war zone, where there are a group of religious lunatics who do nothing unusual. Not necessarily, the victims have also reported on many issues of legislator corruption. You really have enemies everywhere. Ignoring everyone, as he was leaving the conference room in the Mediterranean, Ron suddenly heard a buzzing sound in his ear. Before he could react, a light blue page suddenly appeared in front of him. System loading in progress, system loaded successfully. The treasure chest is ready today. Do you want to open it? The beginner gift pack is ready, do you want to open it? Dot. Luan's pupils tightened, and he breathed a sigh of relief when he saw that no one else had noticed anything unusual here. I haven't read novels for free for so many years, and those authors are not deceiving me. The interlopers indeed have a systematic bonus. Luan took a deep breath and silently recited in his heart. Open, a rough page game with a cutscenes animation of opening a treasure chest, the system shows, today's treasure chest, with one opening for $20 and one opening for $50. Novice gift pack, one bottle of hemostatic potion and one bottle of water lung potion. Dot. Upon seeing the system page that remained silent from then on, Luan blinked and felt a bit confused for a moment. This system is so rudimentary. The intern detectives were all eager to analyze the clues. When intern detective Fisher saw the wound on the deceased's chest, he suddenly frowned and looked up, shouting loudly. Luan, hurry up to my desk and bring the third folder in the upper right corner. Dot. The imagined response did not sound, and Fisher looked back in confusion to find that Ron was sitting in the corner of the conference table, looking down in thought and not paying attention to his words. Fisher's face darkened as he picked up the signing pen in his hand and threw it towards Ron. Pop. Upon hearing the sound of the wind in the air, Ron, who was organizing his memories, instinctively raised his hand and grabbed it. Holding a signing pen and closing the system page, Ron turned his head to look at Fisher, and a memory flashed through his mind. A while ago, when my predecessor went out on a mission with Fisher and another intern detective named Marky, they made a mistake during their actions, causing the criminal to escape. When reporting to the chief, my predecessor was deducted 100 points, while Fisher and Marky were only reprimanded and not deducted a single point. In my memory, my predecessor's face turned blue with anger upon hearing this news, but with no background, he had to temporarily tolerate it in order to become a regular as soon as possible, which made Fisher more and more hesitant towards my predecessor. Wan frowned slightly. He didn't have the kind of patient personality he had before. Just as he was about to take action, Mona, who noticed what was happening here on the other side, forcefully threw her signature pen towards Fisher and asked loudly. What are you doing? Can't you take your own things? Mona is one of the few computer experts among their newly recruited intern detectives, and coupled with her beautiful figure, Fisher didn't say much after being typed with a signature pen. With a cold snort, she picked up her notebook and started recording the clues in the photo. Don't bother with him, he's just a spoiled jerk. Seeing that Juan's face was not looking good, Mona, who was hunched over with a few photos, walked over to him and sat down, comforting him. The information provided by the officer states that the culprit who caught this case can earn 80 points, which can make up for most of the points you lost recently. In addition, this case also has a $50,000 reward from the New York Journalists Association. $50,000. In 2005, the wages of American workers were only around $2,500. Luan didn't care about the 80 points in the front, but the $50,000 in the back made his eyes light up instantly because he remembered what the old assassin had said to him in his previous life. 
I'm not in the mood to listen to those bullshit love stories. When I was young, I just wanted to make money. What's the use of just admiring others? We need to take action on our own. To become richer than them. End of this chapter. Chapter 2. Because he is handsome enough. You are listening at novelfull.audio. Chapter 2 Because he is handsome enough Wuan took the old assassin's words seriously. He had originally thought that if he couldn't survive in the FBI, he would go out and do some private work to make money, but he didn't expect that the FBI would still have legal money to crack a case. Seeing the pile of unsolved cases in the FBI's New York branch archives in my memory, as well as the string of numbers behind the cases, and then thinking of the well.known U.S. Department IRS, Ron suddenly came to his senses and grabbed Mona, who was still introducing the case to him, and asked in a low voice. How about we work together on this case separately and offer a reward of 50-50 afterwards? In general, new intern detectives work in teams of 3 to 5 to investigate such cases, taking into account both the reasonable distribution of points and safety considerations. After all, peaceful America, gunfights every day. Dot. Upon hearing Luan's words, Mona fell silent and smiled a few seconds later. This joke is not funny, Ron. It seems like you haven't solved the case alone since joining the FBI New York branch. That's me from the past, not me now. Luan has great confidence in whether he can solve the case. He doesn't know how to solve it, but he can do it. Both are cases, they should be similar seeing Ron's handsome face, no less than that of a reader, staring at her closely, Mona's heart twitched slightly. After coughing lightly, she turned her gaze to the photo on the table. We'll discuss this matter later. Please take a look at the relevant information about this case first. Okay. Luan did not force Mona, and he did need to take a look at the photos of the crime scene. On the other side, in a bright and spacious office, five middle-aged men wearing shirts were drinking coffee while watching the large screen hanging on the wall. Inside the large screen are real-time images of 20 intern detectives analyzing the case in the conference room. Mediterranean knocked on the door and walked into the office, handing the folders in their hands one by one to the five leaders of the investigation team. They smiled and said. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the personal information and performance during the inspection period of the newly recruited interns in the conference room. Okay. The Mediterranean turned and left, and the five investigation team leaders began to look through the information in their hands. In no time, they selected a few detectives they wanted to transfer to their investigation team in the future. The leader of the first investigation team, B.R.O. Sen, took a sip of coffee and glanced at the character chosen by the leader of the fifth investigation team, August. He frowned and asked in disbelief. Augustus, how did you choose this guy Ron Greenwood? Oh. Did you choose Ryan Greenwood? Upon hearing Branson's words, the other three team leaders became interested, and they also reviewed the performance data of Ron Greenwood during this period, but all chose to give up on each other. Without it, people who are bullied and dare not fight back cannot survive in places like the FBI. Even if Ron turns around and finds an opportunity to beat Fisher, the three team leaders will give Ron a higher rating. The leader of the fifth investigation team is a middle-aged black man with a big belly, named August. Seeing several colleagues looking at him in confusion, Augustus crossed his legs and chuckled. There's no other reason, it's just because Ron Greenwood is handsome. Dot. Several team leaders turned their heads to look at the big screen, and saw that one had short brown hair, tough facial features, a tall and symmetrical figure without appearing bulky. The muscles inside could also be seen through the suit. He is indeed a handsome guy. The leader of the second investigation team nodded and tilted his head with a smile, saying. But what's the use of a soft and handsome guy? I'm afraid I wouldn't even dare to shoot a criminal. And we FBI agents don't need to be too handsome, it's too easy to leave an impression on others. Augustus didn't care about the other person's teasing, drank his own coffee in one gulp, and replied with a smile. 
soft eggs also have their uses. With Ron's face, with just a few months of simple training, it is definitely a weapon against female criminals. Dot. On the other side, in the conference room. Uwan looked at the victim's body in the photo with a calm expression. In his understanding, in a normal crime, excluding the situation of passionate murder, there are only three reasons for killing that remain. For money, for love, for revenge. The wound on the victim's heart in the photo is very large, and based on experience, the distance between the shooter and the victim will never exceed two meters. In addition, if the victim died at night and was shot directly, then, the killer probably followed Mike Robert for a long time and then called out to the victim at the location of their death. In Mona's bewildered expression, Ron analyzed her seriously. But this was actually just a probe. The killer had already determined that the person he wanted to kill was the one in front of him. So, in the moment Mike Robert turned around, he was shot dead with a bang. Wait a moment. Mona crossed her hands and chest, interrupting Juan to continue her analysis. She asked with confusion. How do you know that the killer was following Mike instead of waiting for him there and even calling out to him? This is not important. Juan waved his hand and did not answer Mona's question. These were all the experiences of the assassin, and it was inconvenient to say, so he continued. Based on the photos taken at the crime scene, I can confirm that the perpetrator took one or several things from Mike, which is also the perpetrator's target, so we. Stop. Mona interrupted Luan's analysis and said seriously. Luan, what you're saying now is just your speculation, and the crime scene report doesn't mention that the victim lost something. Why do you believe that the killer had premeditated intent, not passionate homicide? There is also passionate homicide in hate crimes. Luan smiled slightly without answering, then turned to ask. Do you want to join me and work together to solve this case? The reward is half for each person. Mona is a computer expert and she really needs the help of technical talents. She won't play house with you, a rookie who is truly involved in solving a case for the first time. Before Mona could answer, Fisher, who had been analyzing the clues with other agents for half a day, walked over with a notebook and said to Ron. Listen, Ron, as long as you beg me now, I will also leave you a place in my team to organize your information, because you used to organize your information very quickly and neatly, and I am very optimistic about you. Upon hearing Fisher's words, several intern detectives who had a good relationship with him burst into laughter. The guy who had once tricked Ron also walked up to him and hugged Ron's shoulder. This is actually for the sake of Luoan. After careful consideration, just organizing information will give you points. It's so simple and easy, there's no need to go out and run around, and there's no danger of facing criminals. A cold smile hung from the corner of Ron's mouth, and his gaze was heavy. He smiled and hugged Fisher and Marquis's shoulders, saying in a deep voice. How about that? You join my team, I'll go investigate the culprit, and you can help me organize the information. This is also for your good. Just think about it, just organizing the information can earn you points. It's so simple, so easy, there's no danger of facing criminals yet. Ron's words fell into their ears, and Fisher and Marquis's faces turned red and furious. Subconsciously, they reached out to Ron, trying to push him away from their sides. You guys can't believe I'm still going to take action. Before the two of them could react, Ron suddenly shouted out, then clenched his right fist and hit Fisher's left ear hard. He then bent over to avoid Marcy's right hand and kicked him in the ankle with a loud scream. His leg, which had not been retracted in time, was pulled back by Ron and pulled forward in a straight line. Center Fisher's crotch. Ah. End of this chapter. Chapter 3. I am Legitimate Defense. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 3 I am Legitimate Defense In front of the conference room door, Fisher's ears were bleeding and he covered his crotch with his hands, falling to the ground and screaming in agony. Marky lay on the ground with his legs split apart, wailing incessantly, and his left foot twisted in a strange curve. 
Hey. 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 Stop it. Quickly pull them apart. Ron's movements were too fast, from his shouting actual physical exertion to Fisher and Markey lying on the ground in just a few seconds. The many intern detectives in the office had not yet reacted, until they both fell to the ground and screamed in agony, before the intern detectives on the side regained their senses. Several intern detectives who had a good relationship with Fisher glanced at each other and rushed forward in an attempt to knock Ron down. Ron thrust left and right, holding a notebook snatched from Fisher's hand, either horizontally or vertically, effortlessly killing the intern detectives who were trying to surround him, and mercilessly massaging several familiar faces in his memory. Foo.k. Thick gift crab. Jesus. Several intern detectives standing on the side watching the play kept talking and stood in shock, waving their hands at a loss. Those who wanted to argue didn't know which side to persuade. Fisher's side was crowded, while Ron's side couldn't fight. Several female intern detectives on the side stared blankly at this scene, dumbfounded. Mona felt a shiver all over her body for some reason, her face flushed, as if her body had been electrocuted. Owen snorted coldly, knocked down the last person, and threw the notebook in his hand fiercely at Fisher. They're all trash, still solving cases. A group of people can't beat me alone. Ah. The notebook was accidentally thrown askew by Ron and hit Fisher's crotch, causing another scream. With his legs split apart, Maki's eyes flickered with fear and anger, shouting loudly. If you have the ability, don't leave here. Attacking an FBI agent is a serious crime. I won't escape. Who said I'm attacking an agent? The surveillance footage is watching, and a group of people are trying to hit me. This is self.defense. Luan casually pulled the chair next to the conference table and sat down, crossing his legs and sneering. And I suspect you have ulterior motives towards me. A senior detective will arrive soon, and I will sue you for first-degree murder. Foo.k. Upon hearing the felony clause of first-degree murder, those who were still standing in the room looked surprised. They didn't expect Ron to make this matter so big. Mona didn't pay much attention to Luan's words. Her face turned increasingly red. Then she seemed to think of something and shuddered fiercely, her expression instantly clear. In the office with a large screen hanging, the air is incredibly quiet. Seeing Ron sitting quietly in a chair waiting for the investigator in the surveillance footage, the heads of the five investigation teams had different expressions. Number two, number three, the face of the investigation team leader was fine at all, except for being surprised by Luan's extraordinary skills, they didn't express much. After hearing that Ron was going to accuse the intern detectives of first-degree murder, the leader of the fifth investigation team, Augustus, laughed and the leader of the first investigation team, B.R.O. Sen, turned pale. Ha ha ha. Augustus was holding his big belly and laughing, almost gasping for breath. Not bad, I didn't see anyone wrong. Seeing Ron sitting on a chair in the conference room before observing the camera's movements, Augustus believed that Ron had guessed that there would be an investigation team leader observing them after the meeting, so he chose to explode and injure people. But during the fight, except for throwing the note at the end, all of Ron's actions were in line with legitimate defense. If both sides really go to court, excluding off-court factors, Ron's chances of winning the lawsuit are much higher than those of Fisher and Markey. Augustus's laughter slowly faded away, and his gaze towards Ron was extremely hot. I like this kid. He's handsome, intelligent, and skilled. He looks a bit like me when I was young. The leader of the investigation team in 234 glanced at Augustus's big black face and big belly, and then looked at the surveillance footage of Ron sitting there with a handsome face and figure that looked like a model. Chi Chi let out a sigh in his heart. Hello, Brow Sun. Augustus turned his head to look at the leader of the investigation team with a pale face, chuckled, and said. Give me face, let's forget about this matter. The fifth investigation team has just been established, and I happen to lack someone like Luo and who is skilled and intelligent. No way. 
I'll treat you to a drink tonight. No way. Hmm. Augustus raised his eyebrows and pointed to Fisher, who was still holding his crotch and howling in the camera, saying. Then I'll go find the team leader. I'll ask why the previous task failed, and the three-person group only deducted Ron's points. Fu K. Bryson snorted coldly, slammed the table heavily, and turned around to leave with big strides. Good boy. Augustus chuckled and picked up Ron Greenwood's information before leaving the office. The leader of the 234 investigation team glanced at each other, shook his head, and turned to leave. Training Department, Interrogation Room Hey, kid, you're really amazing. Senior Agent York from the Training Department walked into the room, sat down on a chair, picked up a cigarette and started smoking. Do you want one? No, thank you. I don't know how to smoke, said Ron, sitting in a chair with legs crossed, good boy. Old York nodded, put away the lighter, took a beautiful puff of smoke, and began to carefully examine Ron. After a few clicks, he smiled and said. Do you know, Ron? You're completely famous now. On the 23rd and 24th floors of the New York Bureau of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Everyone knows that a tough new intern detective who fights ten times not only wins, but also remains unscathed. It's not that I'm strong, it's that those people are too weak. Upon hearing Ron's words, Old York became even happier. America likes the strong, and his redneck from Texas was even more so. He then asked. Aren't you worried? Juan was puzzled, what are you worried about? Internal fighting among detectives is a serious crime, don't you worry about being suspended or dismissed. Old York scared Luan. I am in self-defense. Luan widened his eyes, filled with sincerity. There is a camera in the meeting room, and the entire process of my attack was recorded. You can't falsely accuse me. Ha ha ha. To be honest, I really like you, kid. If it weren't for someone being quick, I would definitely transfer you to my place. Old York exhaled a puff of smoke and laughed, then stood up and opened the door to the interrogation room. Let's go, kid. Someone's picking you up outside. Thank you, sir. Juan was very polite, got up and walked out of the interrogation room, only to find that Mona was waiting for him outside. Mona walked up and handed the golden FBI badge to Ron, laughing and jokingly saying. Wow, isn't this Ron Greenwood, our top detective in the dozen or so? How's it going? Is the air conditioning in the interrogation room good to blow? Actually, it's okay. At least there's no smell of Fisher and Marky's mouth or body odor here. Ron took the FBI badge, pinned it on his chest, tilted his head to look at Mona, and asked with a smile. It seems that you have agreed to join my team. There's no way, Fisher and those people have all gone to the hospital for an examination, and I'm afraid they won't have the face to come back for a while. Mona shrugged and walked shoulder to shoulder with Ron towards the elevator. The elevator door slowly closed, and Ron reached out to Mona with a smile on his face. So, have a pleasant cooperation. Happy cooperation, by the way, if the case is successfully solved, the reward will be half for each person. Of course, we agreed. New book for follow.up reading. Requesting recommended tickets. End of this chapter. Chapter 4. White and Black Radishes. You are listening at novelfull.audio. Chapter 4 White and Black Carrots New York Presbyterian Hospital. Lower Manhattan Branch. The patient's condition is not serious, just rest for a month. Okay, thank you, doctor. As the doctor turned around and left, the leader of the first investigation team, B.R.O. Sen, turned his gaze to the ward and saw Fisher lying in bed, howling loudly and with his legs still erect. His face darkened and he muttered in a low voice. A bunch of people can't beat just one person, what a waste. Ron Greenwood is covered by Augustus, and Brosun thinks he's not good enough to take action now. However, according to his subordinates, 
Ron Greenwood is currently investigating the Park murder case, as long as he doesn't find the culprit within three days, things will be easier to handle. There was no intention of meeting Fisher, the unlucky nephew, and Browson turned around and left. Office Area of Investigation Team 5, within the office of the team leader. Ron sat on the chair, looking at the big-bellied black man behind the desk with a calm expression. After leaving the interrogation room of the training department, he was brought here by Mona. Luan could easily guess that the other person was the officer who transferred him out. It seemed that his previous behavior of beating Fisher and others caught his eye. As for the small trick of the other party not speaking and just staring at themselves, one doesn't feel much. A simple act of coercion is just treating the other party as a white carrot, well, a black carrot is enough. Black Carrot Augustus looked calmly in front of him, and Ron, who was neither humble nor overbearing, liked him more and more. He didn't talk any more and said directly. I am Augustus, the leader of the fifth investigation team. To be honest, Ron, I really like you. Juan frowned, feeling as if something was not quite right with this statement. But your current situation is very complicated, fighting is definitely not right. Upon hearing these words, Luoan nodded inwardly and arrived. Next was the carrot and the stick. Augustus took a sip of coffee and continued. This is part of the information for the park shooting murder case. It's now December 2000, noon, and I'll give you three days to catch the culprit. If it's successful, I'll immediately transfer you to Investigation Team 5 and make you a regular detective. If it's not successful, Augustus threw the folder on the desktop to Ron and laughed. I will also transfer you to Investigation Team 5, but for the next six months, you will be responsible for organizing documents and writing case reports. Do you understand? Okay. Ron nodded and then looked up to ask. If I successfully solve the case, how will the bounty be divided? If you solve the case yourself, the reward will naturally belong to you. Thank you, sir. Ron stopped talking nonsense and picked up the folder before leaving the office. Seeing Ron's tall back, Augustus nodded in admiration and exclaimed. Young, handsome, and intelligent, with a decisive and polite personality. It's so much like me when I was young. Amidst the curious and puzzled gazes of the detectives, Ron walked out of the office area of Investigation Team 5 without changing his expression. He patted Mona's shoulder, who was waiting for him at the entrance of the office area, and smiled. Let's go, teammate. We have three days to get the bounty. What, do you think three days is a long time? Mona glanced at Juan, took the folder and walked towards the elevator, while looking at the information and asking. Where are we going next? Go get your weapons first. In the equipment warehouse, Mona applied for a bulletproof vest and a Glock 19. After sorting them out, she turned to look at Ron's equipment and suddenly froze in place. I saw Juan wearing a pitch black combat suit, holding a tactical helmet, wearing a tank top with a plate on his chest, and several bags around his waist filled with smoke and shock bullets. There were also two submachine pistols, Glock 18, in the holster. Mona looked closer and saw that one also had six extended pistol clips. The extended magazine of Glock 18 can hold 33 bullets, but you actually have eight full magazines. Mona felt like she was going crazy and questioned loudly. This is New York, we're going to investigate. Do you think this is going to the battlefield? Because this is New York, that's why I took so many things. Upon hearing Mona's shout, Ron spread his hands and looked helpless. If it weren't for the equipment warehouse not allowing it, I would still want to get a few grenades and submachine guns. Fu K. Mona covered her forehead with her hand and whispered to herself. I'm really crazy, I agreed to team up with this kind of person. Luan explained seriously, listen, Mona, there is only one life, and I don't want people to go without making money. Let's go, we only have three days. Seeing the back of Ron strode away, as well as the surprised gaze of the passerby detective, Mona's mouth twitched and hesitated for a few seconds before following. 
I just didn't dare to look up all the way. Central Park, 3 p.m. The two of them drove to the small road at the scene of the crime. It was already daylight and many tourists were strolling in the park. Seeing the figure of Deputy Armed Forces Luoan, passers-by instinctively avoided him, and several patrolling police officers approached to inquire about Luoan's identity, but were all blocked by Mona holding FBI documents. Seeing the puzzled and various gazes around her, Mona suppressed her breath and tilted her head to ask. What are we doing here? The crime scene has been cleaned up by the New York Police Department after taking photos and searching for clues. There are no clues here. Ron stood in contemplation at the location of Mike's body in the photo, and upon hearing Mona's question, he replied. No, the location of the body's death is the biggest clue. Dot. Seeing the question mark on Mona's face, Ron said seriously. Have you ever thought about a question, which is why did the killer kill Mike in this position? Uh, because at that time there were no other people here besides the killer and the deceased. This is just one of the reasons. Luan nodded and continued. The more important reason is that this place is hidden enough, and it's convenient to leave after killing someone. Luan reached out and pointed around to introduce Mona, saying. To the west of this location are rivers and lakes, and several passers-by testimonies do not mention the sound of boats passing by, so the killer cannot escape from the direction of the river after killing someone. On the other hand, to the south and north are small paths leading to the road, and to the east is a large forest. The case report shows that the New York Police Department did not find any useful clues in the forest, so. Mona's eyes lit up and she continued speaking. So did the killer escape the crime scene from a small path to the south or north? No, the killer escaped from the forest. Luan shook his head and continued. When the passers-by in the testimony heard the gunshots, they were all walking together along the north.south paths at the crime scene, so the killer could only escape from the forest. Mona thought about it briefly and found that the testimony was indeed like this. After a moment of reflection, she asked again. But the New York Police Department was searching in the woods to the east with their dogs, and they didn't find any clues. Dogs can't, I can. What? New book for follow.up reading. Requesting recommended tickets. Thank you all. Previously, someone asked the author why the protagonist Ron didn't bring a rifle. Here, I will explain. According to regulations, the main job of FBI agents is to investigate cases and search for clues. So most of the weapons allowed to be carried are handguns, and rifles and submachine guns are not allowed. When encountering enemies, the requirements for FBI agents are seek support immediately and prioritize self.protection. So no FBI agent is knocking on someone's door with a rifle, asking for clues. A long gun and a short gun are two different things. Those who can hold rifles and submachine guns belong to the SWAT operation team in the FBI, which is the department that confronts criminals. As for the equipment of the SWAT operation team, please refer to it at the beginning of the next chapter. End of this chapter. Chapter 5. Tracker. You are listening at novelfull.audio. Chapter 5 Tracker Roan scanned the crime scene and automatically ignored the onlookers in the distance. His expression moved slightly and he began using the killer's technique to simulate the behavior of the perpetrator at the time of the crime. Time seemed to go backwards, and in the dark park path, the killer followed Mike all the way. Mike seemed to notice something and started running, but he didn't shake off the other person. At this moment, the killer called out Mike's name, and Mike reluctantly turned around and agreed to bang. Ron's eyes narrowed slightly, his right hand simulated the action of shooting, and then he stood at the spot where Mike's body was for a few seconds before running towards the forest to the east. Mona, standing next to her, looked bewildered as she watched Luan's movements. She saw Luan running towards the forest and quickly getting up to catch up with him, but there were too many branches in the forest. Mona just lowered her head to avoid the branches, and then looked up and saw that Luan was nowhere to be seen. Shit. 
Mona cursed loudly, but she didn't understand why Ron could run so fast in the woods. Everyone came out of FBI Academy in Virginia. Did someone start a small stove for Ron? Since she couldn't keep up with Luan, Mona decisively chose not to follow and turned her head back to the crime scene, ready to wait for Luan to come and find her. On the other hand, Luan completely disregarded the wild mandarin ducks that cursed him, and his footsteps kept speeding through the forest. He quickly ran out of the forest and arrived on a road to the east of the park. Looking at the constant flow of vehicles on the road, and then looking at several shops across the road, Luo and pondered for a few seconds and turned back to the original path. At the crime scene, Mona was sitting on a chair fiddling with her computer when she saw one waving her hand to indicate that she was here. When she saw one sitting down, Mona asked. So, did you find any clues? Of course. Ron nodded with a smile and said, the culprit should be a soldier who had a difficult life after retiring from the military and came out to take care of him. He may even have retired from the special forces. Why? Because along the way, I only found the footprints of New York police officers and police dogs, and nothing else. Dot. Mona looked speechless. She didn't expect that Juan would make such a righteous statement that she didn't find any clues, but Juan said that not finding any clues was the biggest clue. The place I just walked through is the most suitable place to run after killing someone. There are countless branches in the forest, and anyone passing by will accidentally break a few branches. However, I just checked carefully and found that the newly broken branches either have police dog footprints, police dog footprints, and police boots footprints. There are no newly broken branches or obvious footprints in other areas. Only people in the special forces can have this kind of anti-reconnaissance awareness. After listening to Luan's explanation, Mona stopped fiddling with the computer and tilted her head, wondering. Did she attend a fake FBI training academy? What's wrong? It's nothing. Seeing Luan asking herself, Mona shook her head and pushed the laptop in her hand to Luan, saying. This is the autopsy report just sent over, which shows a small amount of alcohol in the deceased's stomach. Did the deceased drink alcohol during his lifetime? Upon seeing the report, Juan's face immediately lit up with joy and he tilted his head, asking. Can you find out how many bars are south of the park? Why is it south? Mona took the computer and asked, while her fingers searched quickly for relevant information. Because the deceased walked from the south of the park. I guess. Upon hearing Luan's words, Mona pursed her lips and after a few seconds, finished searching and displayed the screen to Luan. There are only two bars near the neighborhood, and more a few blocks away. Okay, let's go to these two bars first. Anyway, we have plenty of time. No, we only have three days. No one has seen the deceased Mike in the bar on the left side of the block. Ron and Mona turned around and walked towards the bar on the right. Have you seen this person before? Seeing the photo in Mona's hand, the bar owner shook his head. He's not a regular at our bar, I didn't see him yesterday. Mona looked up at Juan, who turned to look at the beautiful waitress chatting with someone on the side. The bar owner saw this and loudly called the waitress over. The waitress with long red hair, mainly protruding, walked over and her eyes lit up when she saw Ron's face. Hello, just call me Kristen. Saying it's you guys, but the waitress's eyes were only fixed on Ron. Mona rolled her beautiful eyes and handed the photo to Kristen, blocking their gaze at Ron. Have you seen this person before? Kristen didn't get angry even though her gaze was blocked. She gave Ron a seductive look and took the photo, saying directly. I have seen this person. Yesterday when he came to our bar, he ordered two glasses of red wine and sat in the corner looking like he was waiting for someone. But until the end, no one came, so he finished those two glasses of red wine alone and left. Upon hearing these words, Mona's lips twitched and she instinctively looked at Ron. Unexpectedly, Mike had actually walked into the park from the south before his death. Ron didn't see Mona's expression and learned that Kristen had seen the deceased Mike. 
he quickly asked. Did anyone come in after he left, or did anyone come looking for him? Is there a reward for answering this question? Dot. Luan was speechless, and Mona snorted coldly. She patted Luan's shoulder and said to her. As long as the information you provide is useful, this man will be yours tonight. That's settled then. Kristen smiled and stuffed a note into Ron's arms, then said. There was an old man sitting at the bar, and after the man in the photo left the bar, he followed him closely. Luan turned around in an instant to look at the bar owner. Do you have surveillance cameras here? Christine gave the bar owner a disdainful glance upon hearing this, and her tone was very unpleasant. There's only one, still facing the cashier, mainly because we're afraid of stealing money. Christine. The bar owner was a bit embarrassed, and Kristen didn't bother him either. He lowered his head and took out a dozen notes in his pocket. After searching for them, he took out one and handed it to Ron, shrugging. This is the old man's contact information. Dot. Seeing Ron and Mona looking at her in surprise, Kristen raised her chest with her hands crossed over her waist, and the peaks gathered together. Who did she look down upon? Waiting for you tonight, handsome guy. Kristen stood behind the bar door and waved his arms to the two of them who had left the bar. Ron silently put the note into his pocket, while Mona sat in the car and used her laptop to access the FBI's internal network to search for the owner's identity information. I found it. Soon, the computer displayed who the owner of the phone number was. The owner of the phone number is West Watts, 56 years old. He is a professor at New York University and lives in Cascade. His wife passed away six months ago due to cancer. University Professor Upon hearing Mona's introduction, Ron, sitting in the driver's seat, rubbed his temples and felt a slight headache. Did I analyze it wrong? To be honest, I don't feel that your analysis is correct. Except for the deceased who did indeed enter the park from the south. Mona continued to look down at the information on her computer while saying. Let's go to West's house first and catch him before we talk. Okay. Ron nodded and started the car to turn around and leave the bar. The only sound inside the car was Mona typing with a crackling sound. Luan felt a bit awkward in the atmosphere and was about to say something when Mona suddenly shook her body and shouted. Foo.k, West died in a car accident. Requesting recommended tickets. Please follow up. End of this chapter. Chapter 6 Murder and Mouth Suppression You are listening at NovelFull.audio Chapter 6 Murder and Mouth Suppression Mona shouted so suddenly that Juan almost threw the steering wheel out. The next second, Juan reacted and quickly turned his head to ask. What? When did you die? How did you die? Mona lowered her head and carefully examined the computer, speaking at a lightning-fast pace. I just hacked into the internal network of the New York Police Department, trying to locate West, but found out that West had a car accident ten minutes ago at a crossroads in downtown Queens, and he died on the spot. But the New York Police Department found bomb components in the car's tires. Ten minutes ago. Luan's pupils suddenly shrank, and Mona also thought of something. The two of them looked at each other and spoke in unison. Kill and silence. Does the other party take action so quickly? Upon hearing Mona's crackling keyboard, Ron turned the car and drove towards Queens, rubbing his temples with his left hand, feeling a bit tricky about the mastermind behind the scenes. The car passed two intersections, and Ron seemed to think of something. He suddenly pulled the car over to the side of the road, turned to look at Mona, and said in a deep voice. Mona, is there a possibility that West is not the murderer of Mike, but the person Mike wants to wait for at the bar? Hmm. Upon hearing these words, Mona paused her typing hand on the keyboard and suddenly woke up. Then, following Luan's words, she continued to analyze. Mike wanted to meet with West and talk about something, but West was worried about Mike being followed and the safety of the bar, so he didn't meet Mike at the bar. Instead, 
he waited for Mike to leave the bar and found a place to contact him on his own. That's right. Uwan nodded and continued. Their anti-tracking skills were clearly not working, and in the end, both of them were seen by the killer. The killer killed Mike in the park last night, but couldn't find what he wanted, so he killed West again today. As he spoke, Uwan suddenly clapped his palm and his eyes lit up. He quickly tilted his head and asked. Mona, is there West's car key at the scene of the accident? Car key. Mona was puzzled, but still instinctively began typing on the keyboard. A few seconds later, she looked up and answered. No, the New York Police Department did not find the car key. I knew it. Luan laughed and started the vehicle, turning the direction on the street and rushing out in the other direction. Mona, who was sitting in the passenger seat, felt very uncomfortable due to the inertia caused by the turning of the vehicle. Seeing that the direction of the car was not the location of the accident, she quickly asked. Hey. Ron, where are you going? Go to West's house. Upon hearing Ron's somewhat excited answer, Mona pondered for a few seconds and suddenly realized. Men's car keys are usually hung together with their own door keys. That's right. Uwan nodded and crossed the traffic lights before starting to press the accelerator. The killer definitely didn't find what he wanted on West's body and in the car, so he had to go to West's house to find it. If we're fast enough, maybe we can catch the real culprit later. Seeing the rapidly retreating house outside the car window, and then seeing the car below rushing forward in the traffic, Mona swallowed her saliva and silently changed her hand from tapping on the computer to grabbing the seatbelt. She turned her head and said. Luan, there's no need to be in such a hurry. If something happens, even if you're an FBI, your driver's license will be revoked. Luan chuckled and pressed the accelerator all the way down, confidently saying. Don't worry, I don't have a driver's license, they can't revoke me. WTF. Hee <laughs> hee, just a joke. GG, on a certain road in Skodi, a pitch black SUV suddenly breaks and stops next to a two dot story villa. Mona put on her bulletproof vest and walked down from the passenger seat holding Glock 19. She turned her head to see Ron, wearing a helmet and fully armed, twitching his lips, but still nodding and gesturing in a posture. The two of them walked together towards the door of the villa. Uwan walked up the stairs with a gun in both hands, looked through the glass window, and found no trace of anyone in the room. Seeing Mona waiting for action, she didn't hesitate and kicked the door out with one foot, shouting loudly. FBI open up. Bang, the room was quiet as if no one was there. Mona looked at the broken door under Luan's feet and didn't know what to say, but she still held a gun and leaned against it. Following Luan's footsteps, she quickly searched every house in the villa. Safety. Safety. Confirming that the villa was empty, Mona began to carefully examine the house, only to see the messy mess of magazines, coffee, books, and other miscellaneous items on the ground. It is obvious that the killer was one step ahead of the two of them. Not only did he find something and leave, but he also messed up the villa with the intention of confusing the people who came here to investigate. Mona began to contact the leader of the fifth investigation team, hoping to have them send someone to search the house for clues. When Ron saw the broken glass windows in the kitchen and the seasoning on the stairs, his eyebrows furrowed. Something's wrong. Hmm. Seeing Mona puzzled, Ron didn't hesitate to put on his helmet again and pulled out his gun. He walked slowly towards the back door and said in a muffled voice. The culprit hasn't gone far yet, and the things in the room seem to have been deliberately messed up. In fact, the other person was leaving in a very hurry. Who would have scattered seasoning everywhere? They must have seen our car and made a mistake in their hurry. Mona nodded holding a pistol and following closely behind. Slowly opening the back door of the villa, Ron turned around and rushed out, but there were no pedestrians on the road, only a few parked cars on the roadside. Juan. Mona tilted her head to look at Ron, who made a gesture and slowly walked towards the nearest golden Chevrolet with both hands holding guns, while shouting loudly. 
FBI. Shake the window down. Place your hands on the steering wheel and let me see your hands. Okay. Okay. Don't shoot. The car window slowly opened, and a white girl wearing a camisole skirt appeared in front of the two. Ron scanned briefly and found that there was only one girl in the Chevrolet. Mona breathed a sigh of relief upon seeing this. It shouldn't be her. Ron and Mona exchanged a glance, both understanding each other's thoughts. Ron took a step back, and Mona put away her gun, ready to make a simple inquiry about the girl. At this moment, the black Ford, not far from the golden Chevrolet, suddenly started. Ron raised his gun and was about to shout out to the other person, but the Ford owner's reaction was faster. The car window fell halfway without looking at Ron's position, and he reached out his pistol and pulled the trigger. Bang! 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 Get down! Ron pushed Mona to the ground and pulled out the front door of the golden Chevrolet to block him. Ignoring the passionate high-pitched singing of the girl with the suspender beside him, Ron switched Glock 18 to burst mode and pulled the trigger in the direction of the black Ford. Bang 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 Ron's marksmanship is very accurate. The bullets not only hit the left hand and wrist of the Ford owner holding the gun, dropping the gun in his hand to the ground, but also several bullets passed through the rear window and brushed against his scalp, causing the Ford owner to sweat profusely. Fouquet. After a few loud curses, the Ford owner no longer hesitated and didn't care if the front of the car turned properly. He slammed on the accelerator and rushed towards the direction of the road. Upon seeing this, Ron decisively aimed at Ford's right rear wheel, bang. Gunshots rang out, and the next second, Ford, who had been moving in a straight line, immediately swayed on the road. After not holding on for long, he crashed into the garbage bin on the roadside. Please follow up. Recommended. End of this chapter. Chapter 7. Finding Someone to Carry the Blame on. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 7 Finding Someone to Carry the Blame on, Are You Okay? Seeing a Ford car shattering the garbage bin next to the street, Ron turned around to check the condition of Mona and the sling girl. I'm fine. Mona only had some dust on her body and was not injured, but the girl with the sling was sitting in the driver's seat during the shooting and couldn't come out in time. She had several abrasions on her shoulders and back. It's good if you're not injured. Ron automatically blocked the girl's foul language from the sling and gave Mona a glance to signal her to solve the girl's problem. He then picked up his gun and slowly walked towards the black Ford car that merged with the trash can. As expected by Ron, the driver's cab of the black Ford car was empty. Ron walked around the car and didn't find anything wrong, so he began to search for useful clues. One minute later, Mona walked over and said to Luan with a smile. Just a little girl who skipped classes from school behind her parents' backs has already been driven away by me. Are you sure? Thinking of the girl's ankle strap, Ron shook his head and didn't delve deeper. Instead, he handed Mona the vehicle registration certificate he found in the car and said. There is the owner's name on this, how about it? Can we find out the other person's identity? Three minutes is enough. Mona gave one up a believe me look and turned to retrieve the laptop from the SUV. Before leaving, she also patted Luan's shoulder. You actually found the culprit, you're lucky. My luck is also good. It was said to be three minutes, but in reality, it was less than two minutes. After a crackling keyboard sound, Mona turned the computer screen and gestured for Luan to check the information she had found. Conrad Carter, male, 40 years old, former Marine Reconnaissance Officer. Seeing that the photo on the computer looked the same as the person shooting at him, Ron clapped his hand. I said the killer is definitely a veteran. Yeah. 
Mona nodded helplessly, retrieved the computer, and then asked seriously. What do you plan to do next? The two of us will definitely not be able to beat each other. No, you can't beat the other party. Ron shook his head and said something to make Mona grit her teeth, then took out his phone before the other person had a seizure and said. First, give the officer a call and request that they issue a wanted notice for Conrad Carter. Why? Mona is puzzled. Isn't publishing a wanted notice enough to let the intern detectives in other groups know the identity of the killer? Two reasons, Mona. Ron took out his phone from his pocket and saw Nokia's brick-like mouth twitch, but still explained to Mona. The first point is that our current location is in the small town of Cascade, which is a well-known affluent area under New York City. A dangerous murderer is hiding in this area. If something really happens, the two of us interns can't bear the anger of FBI executives. So we must report this matter. If something happens, it will be a headache for the upper-ups. Upon hearing Luan's words, Mona was somewhat surprised and turned her head to carefully examine him, as if she had met him for the first time. The second point. Luan finally found Augustus' phone number in Nokia's contacts and continued. As long as the FBI issues a wanted warrant, there will be some bounties to some extent. We can catch him and get more money. Dot. Upon hearing that she might still receive the money, Mona's eyes lit up instantly. In a conference room on the 23rd floor of the Jacob Federal Office Building, the leader of Investigation Team 5, Augustus, is in a meeting with other Investigation Team leaders and Team Leader, Veronicus. Didi Didi, upon hearing the phone ring from his waist, Augustus did not hesitate and turned around to leave the conference room. The team leader and other investigation team leaders glanced at Augustus but didn't pay attention. This was the norm for each team leader, and when a case was reached, they naturally needed to quickly answer the phone, even in meetings. But the next second, Augustus's loud voice pierced through the wall and entered their ears. What? You found the murderer now. Upon hearing Augustus's words, the leader of the first investigation team, B.R.O. Sen, instinctively felt a slight unease. Is it the Ryan Greenwood case? But when he thought of passing by the office of the intern agents before his meeting and seeing the footage of those intern agents investigating the social relationships of the deceased and analyzing clues, Browson shook his head and smiled. I definitely overthought it myself. Bang! The door to the conference room was pushed open, and Augustus walked in and directly said to the group leader, Berenice. I'm sorry, sir. I have a shooting case here that needs urgent attention. Veronica's face remained unchanged and she asked suspiciously. Which shooting case? I don't remember you have a small case like a shooting case in your hands. It's a test case for those intern detectives. I have a new intern detective named Ron Greenwood under my command. He just called me and said he has found the perpetrator of the shooting murder and engaged in a firefight with him in the small town of Scasdale. Augustus still has great respect for the group leader, Berenice. There is no other way, and the group's activity funds are all in their hands. When they hear their questions, Augustus immediately asks and answers. The killer is a veteran with strong abilities. After losing a car, he disappeared without a trace. Because the killer has a strong anti-reconnaissance awareness and is good at hiding himself, intern detective Ron Greenwood requested that I issue a reward for the killer and urgently notify the residents of the Cascade area to pay attention to safety. Pop. Browson accidentally dropped his signature pen on the desk. The Cascade area is a well-known affluent area in New York City. Veronese closed the pen in her hand and leaned back on the chair, her eyes fixed on August, saying. If someone gets injured there, I will be very passive, do you understand? Yeah, Augustus nodded, indicating that he understood. I will issue a reward and also mobilize the SWAT tactical team to conduct a blockade and search of that area. Seeing that Veronese nodded in satisfaction, Augustus picked up the notebook on the desk and turned around to leave the conference room. Intern Detective Ron Greenwood 
Veronese jotted down the name Augustus had just mentioned in her notebook, and the corner of Bryson's eye twitched as he saw the scene next to her. In the office of the intern detective. Except for the two-person team of Ryan and Mona, as well as the hospitalized Fisher and Marky duo, the remaining intern detectives are mostly here. Mike's wife doesn't have time to commit the crime. Previously standing in Fisher's position, but being beaten up by Ron, Jody covered his right face with an ice pack and said in a muffled voice. According to the interrogation records, she was attending a seminar in Los Angeles at the time of the incident, and everyone at the seminar was able to testify for him. What are Mike's friends? Either journalists or legislators, or high dot ranking officials from various companies, such as Sean, the partner of this Moraway drug company. Dot. Just as the group of intern detectives who had been beaten up by Ron were analyzing the case word by word, Mediterranean pushed open the door and walked in, shouting loudly. Young men, you have a new mission. Let's all go to the Cascade area to participate in the search operation. What? Jody stood up holding the ice bag and asked in confusion. But sir, we haven't found the perpetrator of the shooting murder yet. Mediterranean waved his hand to interrupt Jody's words and said directly. The target of this search operation is the perpetrator of the shooting and murder case, and their whereabouts were found by both Luan and Mona, so they have already obtained half of the 80 points. Whoever can obtain the remaining points depends on who is lucky enough to catch the perpetrator. WTF Upon hearing the words of the Mediterranean, the intern detective's office suddenly heard waves of particle sounds starting with F. Seeking collection. Recommended. End of this chapter. Chapter 8. Stories in the Clinic. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 8 Stories in the Clinic at 6 o'clock in the evening, in the small town of Scaraday. This hamburger looks good. At the entrance of a fast food restaurant in the small town, Mona sat back in the car with the hamburger and cola she had bought, handed Ron half of it, and said while eating. What should we do next? This afternoon, Juan led Mona to successfully find a clue and discovered the killer's behavior in the past few hours, which has completely established Juan's dominant position in the two-person team. Mona also instinctively hesitated to ask Juan about anything. Taking a big bite of the hamburger and another heavy sip of cola, Ron started the car and started turning the steering wheel. I just called Augustus and he sent information about the killer Conrad Carter to various police stations in the New York area. The wanted list for him has already begun. Good. Mona's eyes sparkled as she tilted her head and asked, how much is the bounty? $5,000. But Augustus has already arrived with the SWAT operation team towards the small town of Scasdale. Upon hearing SWAT's name, Mona's excited expression suddenly calmed down. If they catch the killer, then this money. It definitely has nothing to do with us. Ron swallowed his last bite of hamburger, drank all the cola, turned the steering wheel, and drove the SUV onto the town road. So we must catch Conrad before they come. Wait a moment, Ron. After finishing her food, Mona picked up the computer and her clever intelligence once again occupied the high ground. She turned her head and said with some concern. Even if we find Conrad, we probably won't be able to catch each other on our own, right? According to the information, Conrad is a highly experienced soldier. As you said before, I don't want people to disappear before we make any money. If we catch the killer and solve the case, we can both receive a $50,000 bounty from the New York Journalists Association, as well as a $5,000 bounty on the wanted list. Dot. $27,500 per person. Dot. Our salaries are only $2,000 per month. After receiving the money, I will leave the rundown rental house in Brooklyn and move to a large apartment in Manhattan. Upon hearing Luan's faint words, Mona struck the keyboard fiercely with her hand. Tell me, where are we going to find Conrad next? Ha ha. Ron stepped on the gas pedal and drove the car onto another road in the town, while pointing to the handgun that Conrad had left behind at the scene of the firefight, which was packaged. 
When we were exchanging fire at the entrance of the villa before, I shot Conrad's left hand, causing his pistol to be picked up by us. Upon hearing Luan's words, Mona nodded and began checking her computer. Conrad will definitely find a place to stop the bleeding first, but the thing in the family medicine box clearly cannot treat the gunshot wound, so he is likely to go to a private clinic in the town. That's right. Luan stepped on the accelerator and the SUV rushed out in an instant. The small town of Scaraday is not big, with only two private clinics. The two of them quickly arrived at the nearest one. Hello, FBI. Mona and fully armed Ron walked into the clinic. Ron took out the FBI's golden badge and waved it in front of the pretty girl at the front desk, asking. Have you received a patient with a left-hand injury this afternoon? Uh, there's nothing. The beautiful girl was a bit stunned, but she quickly realized and replied. The clinic only received a girl with a scraped back this afternoon. Luan and Mona exchanged a glance and guessed who the girl at the front desk was. Just as they were about to continue questioning, the door on the side of the front desk suddenly opened. A middle-aged white doctor in a white coat walked out, holding a middle-aged white woman with a rosy face and a lazy aura everywhere. Dot. Luan and Mona exchanged a glance, both adults, and at a glance, they could tell what the other two had just experienced. See you the day after tomorrow, Dr. Tim. The white woman in a good mood glanced at Ron and Mona, but ignored them. She threw a kiss at the doctor on her own and turned around, leading her pet dog towards the clinic gate. See you the day after tomorrow, Ms. Uland. Tim, wearing a white coat, nodded calmly and turned his gaze to the two of them when he saw the woman leave. He smiled and asked, Do two detectives come to me for anything? Luan ignored the tattered matter under his pants and asked directly. Did anything strange happen at your clinic this afternoon, such as lost medication or malfunctioning cameras? No, everything in our clinic is normal. Dr. Tim shook his head and said that his clinic has never installed cameras or similar devices for the sake of customer privacy. Dot. Is it for your convenience to have an affair? Luan was speechless and was about to continue asking the other party a few more questions when suddenly the screams of Ms. Uland came from outside. Where's my car? Who stole my car? Damn it, I'm going to kill that car thief. Upon hearing the shout, Mona hurriedly rushed out and asked the infuriated Ms. Uland. Madam, when did you come to the clinic? Forty minutes ago. Ms. Uland, holding her pet dog, was very panicked and grabbed Mona's arm, shaking it vigorously. Hurry up and find my car. My husband is a Yale congressman. You must find the car. Otherwise, I'll be done. Dot. Upon hearing that the woman had arrived at the clinic forty minutes ago, Ron suddenly thought of something and quickly turned to the clinic owner, asking. Doctor, take me to your clinic's pharmacy now and see if there's anything lost. No need to look, Mr. Detective. Dr. Tim's expression on his face was even more flustered than Ms. Yulan's, I lost the key to the pharmacy. Fu K. The other party and Ms. Yulan played in the ward for 40 minutes, and no one knows when the pharmacy key was lost. Luan cursed softly and rushed out of the clinic to run towards the SUV. Unexpectedly, Mona was already sitting in the passenger seat waiting for him. Don't worry, Ron. Seeing the anxious expression on Ron's face, Mona calmly said as she clattered on the keyboard. I just asked Ms. Uland about her lost car model and license plate number, and found out that the other party's car is the latest Cadillac. So. Ron doesn't have much research on cars and doesn't understand what Mona means. The latest Cadillac has installed satellite positioning systems in every car for customers' safety considerations. Mona smiled calmly, her fingers fluttering as a pile of code popped up on the computer that Ron couldn't understand. A few seconds later, Mona typed the space and a sparkling, rapidly moving red dot appeared on the map. This is the road north of the small town of Scasdale. Mona showed the computer screen to Ron and smiled. It seems that the other party hasn't run far yet. 
I love you so much, Mona. Bringing you into my team was the most damn right thing I did. Luan laughed and turned the steering wheel, pressed the accelerator and drove the SUV towards the red dot on the map. Seeking collection. Please follow up. Recommended. End of this chapter. Chapter 9. For Consecutive Explosions. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 9. For Consecutive Explosions to the north of Scaraday Town is a small forest, and it is already evening. The streetlights on the road in the forest begin to illuminate. Sir, I am Mona. The pitch black SUV shuttled rapidly on the winding road, and Mona silently suppressed her nervousness. She was holding Ron's phone and reporting the current situation to Augustus on the other end of the phone. The killer Conrad snatched a Cadillac from a legislator's wife and is currently on the run on the road. We request the SWAT operation team to intercept him. SWAT team will arrive in 10 minutes. On the other end of the phone, Augustus sat calmly in the riot car and said. However, I have already informed the New York Police Department that they have dispatched the closest patrol to the target location to stop them. You must be careful. Okay, sir. Mona hung up the phone, casually stuffed Ron's Nokia into her pocket, lowered her head, and continued tapping the computer keyboard with a nervous expression. What should we do next? I just checked with Ms. Yulan's husband, a Yale congressman. He is a staunch Republican in the New York area and also a staunch gun supporter. He has repeatedly stated in public that he carries guns wherever he goes, and is no exception in the car. It is truly America. Luan felt a bit helpless, but things were just a step away from him. He couldn't possibly back down, so he tilted his head and instructed Mona. Put on your bulletproof vest and be more careful when encountering enemies later. Okay. Mona nodded, distinguishing the importance of her own life safety. The SUV was speeding on the road, and after turning a few corners, Ron saw himself getting closer and closer to the red dot on the computer when suddenly there was a fierce sound of gunfire outside. Bang 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 One immediately pressed the accelerator all the way down, and the SUV climbed over the hill ahead, immediately seeing the front of the car shattered and hit the New York Police Department cars on both sides of the road. Not only that, there are also two patrol officers on the ground who are handling emergency situations for another patrol officer lying on the ground who was shot. Luan stepped on the brake and Mona quickly opened the car window, asking. What happened? A Cadillac forcefully passed through the temporary checkpoint we set up. One of the patrol officers said with lingering fear, when the other party charged for the card, they even took out a rifle and fired at us. Have you seen the other person's appearance clearly? A middle dot aged white man. Okay, thank you for your message. Mona raised her hand and threw the emergency medical bag under the co-pilot to the two police officers, and Ron kicked the gas pedal and rushed out. Thanks to the Yale congressman's help, Conrad now has a rifle. Seeing Mona touch the bulletproof vest on her chest, Juan frowned. You go hide it in the back seat of the car. Okay. At the critical moment, Mona didn't show off and picked up the computer, got up, and moved from the front passenger seat to the back seat of the car. Seeing Mona sitting in the back seat of the car with her seatbelt fastened, Juan's eyes instantly became sharp. Racing time starts. Under the night, the forest roads are brightly lit on both sides, and not far away is the brightly lit downtown area of New York, where nightlife in big cities has just begun. A powerful engine roar echoed from far to near, and then a pitch black lightning flashed rapidly across the road. The SUV raced on the road, with Luan sitting in the driver's seat with a cool tone on his face, manipulating the steering wheel with both hands, performing a ten times crazier overtaking than before. Through the rearview mirror, Conrad saw the black SUV getting closer and closer to him. 
His heart was pounding with pain in his left hand, and it was the first time he had met someone driving like this on a winding road in the forest. Yu Guang glanced at the rifle on the co-pilot's seat, and Conrad's heart froze. He slammed the steering wheel and pressed the brake, leaving two deep ruts on the ground for Cadillac. The co-pilot's direction was aligned with the SUV, and Conrad's face instantly turned grim. He sat in the car, grabbed his rifle, and pulled the trigger towards the car chasing him. Let's all go to hell. Bang 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 one. The other side is shooting. Gunshots rang out, Mona screamed in fear, and Ron turned the steering wheel with a serious expression to dodge. The SUV looked like a snake racing on a forest road, winding at speed without slowing down, and getting closer and closer to Cadillac. In Conrad's stunned gaze, the SUV with several bullet holes on the window but the driver unharmed hit Cadillac's right side heavily. Bang, are you crazy? Ron. Mona in the back seat of the car cursed loudly. Bend down and don't move. At the moment when the other party was hit, Ron endured the discomfort and picked up a shock bullet from his waist before throwing it into the back seat of Cadillac. Shockwave, a non-lethal weapon that primarily utilizes tremendous sound and strong light to stun enemies. Bang! A huge and incomparable noise echoed inside the Cadillac, and the windows of both cars instantly burst and scattered all over the ground. Ron bent down to dodge the Glock 18 on the side of the SUV, while pulling Mona out of the car and behind him. Looking up, he saw no one in the driver's seat of the Cadillac and understood that the other person had just jumped out of the car and had not been harmed by the shockwave at the center. Without saying a word, Ron picked up another shockwave and threw it over. Bang! The shock bomb exploded again on the other side of the Cadillac, and after thinking for a moment, Ron still felt unsafe. So he threw all four remaining shock bombs in his pocket. Bang! 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 Four consecutive explosions rang out, and Ron felt much more at ease. He stood up and held up Glock 18, suddenly charging towards the side of Cadillac, only to find that Conrad had been completely paralyzed by the shockwave. Carefully kicking the rifle into the distance, Ron took out handcuffs and handcuffed Conrad, who was unconscious, to both hands and feet before finally letting out a sigh of relief. Start touching the corpse. No, it's checking if the other person's body has hidden weapons. Mona, who was covered in dirt all over, walked cautiously to the side of the Cadillac with a pistol. She breathed a sigh of relief when she saw the enemy being handcuffed and Ron unharmed. However, remembering the car accident just now, she still couldn't breathe a single breath of anger. After putting away her gun, she gave Ron a hard blow on the arm. You're such a lunatic. Ron. I told you before that you should trust my driving skills. Ron waved his hand and put a yellow notebook he had touched into his pocket. In his past life, he drove a certain light van and raced with people on winding mountain roads, but he never lost. If it weren't for the task at that time, he would have gone to an international competition to compete with others. This is not a matter of driving skills, it is a matter of life safety. Just as Mona was about to give Juan a good lecture, Juan's nose twitched slightly and suddenly covered her mouth. What? Ron's face was solemn, and he took out Glock 18 and pointed to Cadillac's trunk. Mona immediately realized and took out a pistol to aim at the trunk. Two people, one on the left and one on the right, stood on both sides of the trunk. Ron gestured to count down three, while Mona nodded and prepared. Bang, at the end of the countdown, one suddenly opened the trunk, and Mona immediately raised her pistol to prepare the trunk. The girl who appeared in front of the two was on the brink of death. Seeking collection. Recommended. End of this chapter. Chapter 10. Group Leader Vironis.
You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 10 Group Leader Vironess, It's the girl with the suspender, but why is she here? Owan recognized the other person's identity at a glance and quickly put away his gun to check his condition. He found that the girl had been shot in the shoulder, and excessive blood loss was the main reason for her coma. Mona saw the girl with a pale face and increasingly rapid breathing, feeling extremely anxious. She instinctively looked at Ron. I remember she left before. What should I do? I just threw the emergency medicine box to the patrol officer on the mountain. It's okay. Wan's eyes twitched slightly and he said in a deep voice. Her current situation is not suitable for moving. You can immediately drive back to the patrol to retrieve the medicine box. I will call the nearby hospital here and ask them to send an ambulance here as soon as possible. Okay. Mona nodded, put away her gun, and quickly drove the unglazed SUV back down the same path. Seeing the shadow of the SUV completely disappear, Ron first called the hospital and asked them to quickly send an ambulance here. Then he turned around to confirm that Conrad was still unconscious, and finally relieved himself by opening the light blue system page and taking out the bottle of hemostatic. This is still Juan's first time using the system to create a potion. The potion is packed in a small transparent glass bottle that is 5 cm high and 4 square square. The overall color is red. When the bottle cap is opened, there is no smell. Seeing that the glass bottle was written for oral use, Ron opened the girl's mouth and poured the entire bottle of medicine into it. A few seconds later, the wound on the girl's shoulder did not heal, but it no longer bled outwards. In a moment, Mona returned in her SUV. Before she could get off the car, Juan snatched the emergency medical bag from her hand. By the time Mona got off the car and walked to the girl's side, Juan had almost bandaged her. Mona didn't think much, she just thought that Juan was the life of the emergency girl. By the way, Mona. Wrapping a bow around the girl's wound, Ron turned to Mona and asked with a smile. Have you decided which investigation team to go to after becoming a regular detective? Dot. An hour later, Ron and Mona returned to the 23rd floor of the Jacob Federal Building. At this moment, the office of the intern detective was brightly lit and bustling. The intern detectives who had gone out for free all looked enviously at the two of them, Ron and Mona, sitting at the front of the office, whispering with their heads down. According to the relevant regulations during the internship period, after solving a case, the intern detective needs to tell several senior detectives in charge of the intern detective the entire process of solving the case. After listening, the senior detective will ask questions and give a score based on the performance of the intern detective. This score determines which position an intern detective will hold in the investigation team after becoming a regular, such as a technical detective searching for information or a field detective running on the field. That is to say, they were luckier than us and found the clue to the killer first. Jody, who stood in Fisher's position but was beaten up by Ron, took a sip of coffee handed over by his teammate and looked at Ron and Mona disdainfully saying. I heard that when they arrested someone this time, they destroyed a subsidiary car of the headquarters. I don't know how the team leader will punish them later. Definitely deducted from salary. The intern detective sitting next to Jody wearing glasses smiled. I went to ask, they destroyed our latest SUV from the criminal investigation department. Think about the rumors outside that the team leader, Berenice, is in charge. Are you talking about being stingy? Cough cough. At this point, the two of them exchanged a glance and became happy together, sitting and waiting to watch the good play. The group leader in the second population is named Vironis, who is the immediate supervisor of the leaders of investigation teams 1 to 5, and also the woman who holds the funds for the five investigation team actions. The female intern detective Elena, who had heard all the conversation between the two, gave them a disdainful glance. It's fortunate to say that others are lucky, but Jody and his team are all wrong in their search for the killer. Even if it wasn't Ron and the others who found the real culprit in the end, it definitely wasn't Jody and the others. 
Thinking of this, Elena turned her gaze to the front of Ron, her gaze gradually blurred, and she began to savor Ron's handsome profile. Here we go, here we go. The door to the office was pushed open, and the intern detectives quickly stopped talking and began to sit upright, hoping to leave a good impression on the senior detective who would listen to the case later. What these intern detectives didn't expect was that although the familiar senior Mediterranean agent was pushing open the office door, the first person to enter the office was the team leader, Berenice. What? Team leader? Why did she come? Seeing the group manager, Berenice, wearing a women's suit, with sleek short hair and an expressionless expression, the office of the intern detective suddenly became buzzing. Behind Veronese, there were five investigation team leaders sitting at the forefront of the office, while the senior Mediterranean detective who used to be responsible for listening to cases had no place to sit and could only stand on the side of the office. As one of the parties involved in solving the case, Mona also had some doubts. She didn't understand how this was just a small murder case that caught the attention of the team leader. After not understanding the reason, she instinctively looked at Ron. Dot. In fact, Luoan didn't understand why he attracted the attention of the officer, but he didn't care. Troops for the enemy, earth for floods, and he didn't do anything illegal. So he stood up decisively, with a smile on his face, and walked confidently with Mona to the front of the office. Ignoring the group leader B.R.O. Sen, whose face was as black as the bottom of the pot, Owen gestured for Mona to place the materials from her laptop in front of the group leader Veronicus, coughed lightly, and then smiled. Good evening, officers. I am intern agent Luoan, and this is my teammate, intern agent Mona. Just give a brief introduction to the time and location of the deceased's death and other related information, and Luan begins to explain all the cases he solved after 12 o'clock today. Firstly, the escape route of the killer was determined in the park. Then, based on the autopsy report, the bar where the deceased had been before his death was found, and clues to the identity of the second person following the deceased were obtained. Following the clues, the killer was encountered outside the pursuer's villa. Finally, they engaged in a fierce battle of wits and fought fiercely, and after much effort, they finally succeeded in capturing the real culprit. Mona. Dot. The intern detectives who listened to this long experience were stunned, and several investigation team leaders were also quite engrossed, including the first investigation team leader B.R.O. Senator. Except for group leader Veronese. After seeing Juan finish recounting today's experience, Veronese expressionlessly opened her notebook and pondered for a few seconds before asking. The killer Conrad is a veteran. Why did he kill war correspondent Mike Robert and New York University professor West Watts? What is the reason? Upon hearing Veronica's question, everyone who had just been immersed in Ron's storytelling came to their senses. That's right, Ron just caught the killer, but didn't explain why the killer did it, what was the reason, personal grudges or old grudges. Sorry, sir. Augustus on the side quickly gave Ron a glance and then explained. Ryan is an intern detective and does not have the qualifications to interrogate the killer Conrad, so he, so Ryan can't answer your question, sir. Team leader B.R.O. Sen smiled and took August's words. August's face instantly turned even darker than the bottom of the pot. Recommended. Seeking collection. End of this chapter.